Kirsten Moore began her collegiate journey as a walk-on at the University of Oregon. She ultimately earned a full scholarship and became team captain through a relentless work ethic and positive attitude. She was blessed to participate in four NCAA tournaments, was selected to her associate, excuse me, she was selected to her, by her teammates, I'm sorry, as a 1998 Bev Smith most inspirational player. Twice she earned academic all Pac-10 honors. In 1998, she was nominated for the regional GTE academic all-American recognition. After she graduated, she served as an assistant coach in the Ducks women's basketball program, and then moved on to the University of California at Berkeley, where she served as an assistant women's basketball coach for four years. She left Cal and arrived at Westmont in the summer of 2005, becoming the head women's basketball coach. She brought the Westmont women's basketball program to new heights as winners of the NAIA National Championship in 2013. The Warriors posted a record of 30 and 4 on the way to the 2012 and 13 national title. The Warriors also won the 2012 13 Golden State Athletic Conference regular season championship by going 14 and 0. And as a result, Kristen was named the 2013 NAIA Coach of the Year. In 13 years under Moore's leadership, the Warriors have posted a 73% winning record, winning percentage having won 304 games while losing 111. But in addition to her coaching duties, Kirsten also serves as the Associate Director of Athletics. And she describes herself as encouraging, positive, competitive, and compassionate about the game but moreover, passionate about people. She states, I want my players to grow deeper in their relationship to God and to see in a very practical sense how that applies to their athletics, their academics, and their future jobs and families. I could continue to extol the virtues of Kirsten Moore, but I know you want to hear from her directly. So please join me now in welcoming Kirsten Moore to the dais. Well, thank you. Uh, it is an honor to be here today on this Good Friday and uh, as we celebrate together the hope that this Easter weekend brings. Um, before I get into what I've prepared to share with you today, um, I just want to say that uh, I am like overwhelmed with gratitude being in this room because I feel like I'm just looking around and whether it's just people from my church or people from Westmont or my village of friends who have done life with me every day uh, to some of my players who on their first opportunity to actually not go to school or have basketball today and could have slept in. They got up at the six o'clock hour in order to be here. So that was pretty awesome. Yeah, exactly. That does deserve a hand. Um, and, uh, and so I am just really grateful for so many people in this room because I've not walked this journey alone and so many people have been a part of, uh, a part of this. Um, uh, ever since I can remember, I have had a passion for sports. Uh, in fact, my parents tell me that the first word I ever said was ball. Uh, I spent my childhood tagging along with my older brother, um, playing sports with the big boys, and therefore uh, finding great success against kids my own age. Uh, before long, I developed an insatiable thirst to be the best in whatever I did. In school, I strived to get 100% on every test and assignment. Uh, in sports, I not only wanted to be the best girl, uh, but I wanted to beat the boys too. Anything short of perfection was unacceptable in my eyes, and my classmates, uh, or and that even pushed me to work harder and to be better. So in the fourth grade, my classmates, um, I don't know, like it's like a couple girls talking. I don't know. Somehow they came up with this nickname and they started calling me Limp. And it stood for Little Miss Perfect. So 
as if like I didn't already put enough pressure on myself um, already to be the best. Now everyone else was expecting perfection from me all the time too. So uh, I'm sure some people in this room have been in that position when like you get your tests back, get handed back in class and you know, everyone's like, oh, what'd you get? What'd you get? You know, I was like, oh, if I got better than her, then like I really scored, I did great, you know? And, um, and you know, I mean, they beat me in tetherball, four square, whatever. It was like a big deal. And so you get the idea. Like it just reinforced this idea in my mind that like the only option for me was to succeed all the time in everything that I did. For Christmas one year, I got a book from my parents. They always gave me a book uh, every Christmas. And it was about a young girl overcoming really any obstacle that came in into her way to achieve her dream. My parents had written on the front cover to Kirsten, who can be anything she wants to be. The American dream, really, in words that would motivate me and give me hope for years to come. So in middle school, I was at a basketball camp and a Stanford women's basketball player came and talked about what it was like to be a collegiate student athlete in the Pac-10 and a dream right then was born to play basketball in the Pac-10. I know there's 12 schools now, but I told you I was old getting up there, so it was 10 schools at the time, okay? And um, so my middle school and high school years were really consumed with just working towards my goals of playing Pac-10 basketball and living up to this kind of impossible standard I'd set of, of perfection. And although I obviously wasn't perfect, I did do a pretty good job of it and uh, headed off to play basketball at the University of Oregon. And then a funny thing happened. There I was, living my dream, and yet I wasn't satisfied. This couldn't really be all that life was about, could it? My aha moment came in the middle of my freshman year. So I'd been invited by a senior girl on the softball team to go to a Bible study that was put on with other athletes, um, put on by Athletes in Action. And it was there that I heard our quarterback on our football team at the time share about his Rose Bowl experience. So this guy had grown up in Southern California. His like ultimate dream was like playing in the Rose Bowl on New Year's Day. And not only did he play, but he ended up being named Rose Bowl MVP. So here he is back after this, and he's talking to us, and he shared that as he laid in bed that night after the game, he realized that as fun as that experience was, that the world will ultimately let you down. I since heard a quote um, by Ravi Zacharias that kind of sums up um, what he was saying. It says, the loneliest moment in life is when you have just accomplished that which you thought would deliver the ultimate, and it has let you down. I'll say that again. The loneliest moment in life is when you have just accomplished that which you thought would deliver the ultimate, and it has let you down. Um, just as a side note, as I was thinking about it, it's super interesting how lately there's been a bunch of, bunch of articles coming out about Olympians who have kind of talked about this same thing. So there this guy was. He just accomplished everything that I was like trying to do, earn a starting position at Oregon, win a Pac-10 championship. And here he was saying that as incredible of experience it was, it wasn't going to bring lasting fulfillment. He confirmed my suspicion. There had to be more to it. So I set out on a journey for truth. I grew up going to church on Christmas and Easter, but it felt kind of more like a religious thing to do than something that actually like affected me on a daily basis. I hadn't really explored ever what I actually believe. Like, does God actually exist? And if there is a God, then what's the right God, right? At Oregon, we didn't really have classes on apologetics and all these world religions and stuff like we have up at Westmont. Um, but So I kind of took matters into my own hand. I marched down to Knight Library. Yes, everything's named after the Knights up at Oregon. I marched down to the library and I checked out books on like every different like major religion to see what they all had to say about God. I was a science major and I wanted facts to lead my investigation in pursuit of truth. 
Well, I was particularly challenged um, by a book by Josh McDowell called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. The book was so long, it's now published in two volumes. Um, so needless to say, it had a lot of information. It took me a long time to kind of work my way through it. But the part that really hit home with me was that it showed a substantial amount of compelling evidence about the resurrection. And the resurrection, what we're getting ready to celebrate on Sunday, was absolutely the linchpin of the entire Christian faith. It's pretty much like blew my science-based mind away, but after studying the evidence, when it came to making a decision, it actually seemed to me much more reasonable to believe that God existed and that Jesus really did rise from the dead than any of the alternative options. And what started as this like intellectual journey started moving from my head to my heart as I started reading the Bible and God's truths and promises started taking root inside of me. Through Christ's blood shed on the cross this day on Good Friday, I was actually seen as perfect in God's eyes. And understanding and embracing God's unconditional love gave me a freedom I'd never experienced. Freedom to take my eyes off of myself and my need to be Little Miss Perfect and to put them on God, his purposes, and his people. My foundation shifted from my insufficient efforts at perfection to the unchanging love of a perfect God. Through this new lens, basketball really shifted for me and became not just a challenge to try to be the best or to win a championship trophy, although I 100% uh, believe that we are called to, to be our absolute best with the talents and the opportunities that we're given. But my basketball became a platform to use my passions and my talents to develop relationships with people that go deep enough to change people's lives. And joining God in life-changing work with people was something that would bring me lasting fulfillment long after the arena lights go out and the trophies are sitting there gathering dust. So as, uh, as he mentioned, um, I had the opportunity to join the coaching staff at Oregon and then a door opened for me to go down to Cal Berkeley where I coached and uh, that eventually led me down here to West uh, Santa Barbara where I've now been the coach uh, for 14 years at Westmont. Um, I arrived here on campus in the fall of 2005 with the goal of making a positive impact on young women's lives, like these ladies over here, through my role as a basketball coach and the belief that at Westmont we could bring our program to a place where we could win a national championship. But big dreams require a lot of work, and one of my first steps was actually to get my own self back into shape. Um, I'd actually suffered a spinal cord injury a couple years before and um, had been kind of relegated to non-impact exercises. And, uh, but here I was in Santa Barbara, great weather, mountains, so I thought, okay, perfect place to start learning how to ride a bike. Not that I didn't know how to ride a bike, but like really ride, like cycling ride, right? So I went to the chair of our kinesiology department. He was a big, like he used to do triathlons and Ironmans and all this. And so I knew he rode bikes a lot. So I went and I asked him like, I need help getting started. Like, what do I need? Like, what, 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 what bike should I get? All of those things. To which he replied, you know who you really need to talk to is my good friend, Alex. He's a professor here. He's a competitive cyclist and he really knows his stuff. So it wasn't long before Alex had me set up with this really good looking, slick road bike, this like Italian frame, really nice, that he found some like really amazing deal on eBay for me for. So I got that and then we were off into the hills of Montecito, uh, him teaching me the ins and outs of this new sport of cycling. Um, well, to make a long story short, uh, let me tell it like this. Boy likes girl. Girl tells boy she's not interested in being more than friends. Boy wisely says, oh, that's okay, we can just be friends. Boy and girl spend hundreds of hours riding bikes all over the mountains of Santa Barbara, talking about teaching, coaching, life, God. Boy professes love for girl. 
girl almost crashes her bike and then tells the boy that it is never going to happen and that he should go 2,000 miles away to go get his PhD. Boy is heartbroken, but two days later wakes up thankful because he knew in his heart that he was supposed to go take this amazing opportunity in Missouri and that this girl would have been totally capable of derailing his course. <laughs> but he trusted the walls that this girl had up had actually kept him on track to maximize his gifts. Well, then once the pressure was off, because the boy was moving away, girl lets down her walls and slowly but surely realizes she might actually have feelings for this boy after all. And, uh, this is way oversimplified, but needless to say, uh, Alex and I found ourselves trusting that God was in all of that craziness and stayed committed to Alex getting his PhD in biomedical sciences with the leading exercise ph physiology researchers in the world, 2,000 miles away. A year of long distance dating somehow remarkably brought our hearts even closer, and in June of 2007, Alex made me put the cycling skills he taught me to use, and without my knowing, he was even in the state of California, had a friend of ours convince me to ride my bike up Old San Marcos Road and across the 154 and up Painted Cave, which is really, really steep, and get up to the top of the mountain where he was waiting for me with an engagement ring. But we knew we had at least three more years of long distance, and we needed God's help to stay the course. So we spent that year of engagement apart memorizing all of Romans chapter 8. We picked it because there's so much good applicable truth in it that could encourage us day by day as we kind of went through this journey. Each day I would get up in the morning, I'd write the next sentence or two on the index card, and then I'd tape it to the handlebars of my bike, and off I would go for an hour ride while I repeated the words over and over in my head. And then every so often, we would recite to each other how far we'd gotten while we'd talk on the phone at night, and uh, it was kind of like a little test, actually, it was really kind of like a competition, and um, by line by line through the 39 verses of Romans chapter 8. So here's just a few of those verses. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. If God is for us, who can be against us? Or as my friend in college used to say, if God's with me, can't nobody get with me. <laughs> who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or danger or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Little did I know how setting these truths in my heart was growing those seeds of faith that were planted back at the University of Oregon and building them into a foundation of truth that would prepare me to be able to handle a much tr harder trial ahead. And that these words that I planted in my mind would repeat themselves back to me over and over in my time of greatest need. In January of 08, Alex was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. It's an autoimmune disease that attacks your digestive tract. In addition to being extremely painful and uncomfortable, Crohn's can lead to malnutrition, loss of intestines, and a bunch of other kind of really bad things. Um, Romans 8:18. 8, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. On May 17, 2008, Read over here, married us, and we said, I do, and became husband and wife. And then the story's supposed to go, and they lived happily ever after. 
Well, not exactly. Uh, we had to endure two more years of long distance, but then we were finally blessed with the amazing news that the newly titled Dr. Moore was going to have a tenure track teaching position back at Westmont, reunited at last. My team literally shrieked for joy when we told them at our team Christmas party that a new little warrior would be arriving that summer. And uh, our quest for our first conference championship was in full swing. All the while, Crohn's disease was eating away at Alex's insides. Alex soldiered through the rest of the semester, determined to finish teaching classes. And then on Monday after graduation, we headed down to Los Angeles for surgery to get his colon removed. The surgery went great. When the surgeon came out and told me the good news, I texted all our friends and family, like, best possible news. Colon successfully out. He's all hooked up. Thanks for your prayers. When Alex woke up from anesthesia and he heard the great news about the surgery, he just beamed with joy. I could somehow see the weight of the disease had left him. I sat on the edge of his hospital bed holding his hand. He told me how much he loved me, how thankful he was that he got to marry me and how he was so excited to be better so that he could support me and the baby. He said that he felt new, which is kind of funny since he'd literally just had his guts cut out, and that he had never felt as close to God as he did then. 9 p.m. rolled around, and always wanting to protect me, he insisted that I go home to our friend's house to get a good night's sleep for me and the baby since I was somewhere between seven and eight months pregnant. I kissed him on the forehead, told him I loved him, and that I would see him at 5.30 in the morning for the doctor's rounds. And then the unthinkable happened. <clears throat> I awoke in a daze a little bit before 4 a.m. because my phone was on silent, but it seemed to just like keep lighting up on the bed next to me. I looked at it and saw a bunch of missed calls and voicemails from an unknown number. I pushed the button to listen to the message, and I'll never be able to get the voice of the surgeon out of my head. Kirsten, I need you to call me immediately. Alex is in very serious condition. He's actually coding right now, and they're working on him. Yeah, he left that on a message. <laughs> then the next message, uh, Kirsten, it's quarter to four. Alex did not make it. It's a phone call. This is him saying, it's a phone call I didn't think uh, I'd ever have to make over a message. He died. He died of a pulmonary embolism. He was pronounced at 344. <clears throat> Alexis, it's okay. Daddy was in heaven, but Mommy was still pretty darn sad. <laughs> <clears throat> the darkness descended before I could even hear the end of the message. I screamed at my friend and kind of staggered um, to hand her my phone and then collapsed on the air mattress on the floor and just started beating my fist into the mattress. Like, there's no way, no way. Like, it can't be real, it can't be real, but it was. He was gone. It was the longest day of my life. Uh, the seconds ticked by so slowly that I wondered how I was gonna make it through a single hour, let alone a day, a month, a year, or a lifetime. My friends and family all rushed to LA to be with me. Many of my fellow coaches um, and kinesiology faculty were there within hours and sat with me as the t seconds slowly ticked, ticked, ticked. Somehow evening finally came, and before the caravan back up to Westmont um, started, my friends prayed with me. And to be honest, I have no idea like what they prayed. Um, but over and over, uh, it went in my head. And when they finished the prayer, I looked up, um, thanked my dear friends, and said, I don't know why God let this happen, but this I do know. God was good yesterday, and he's still good today. And I believe that to my very core. Romans 8, 26 to 28. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. 
And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Foundation. Therefore, if anyone hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, it's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You know, honestly, looking back, I can't really even explain my response because, believe me, the whole world just felt black. But yet, God's truth stood solid. And as we talk this morning about keeping hope alive on this Easter weekend, I can say that maintaining hope was an absolute key to my journey through the dark valley. One of my favorite movies is Shawshank Redemption. Most of you probably in here have seen it, yeah? And uh, right at the end, there's this, uh, there's this quote that says, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. I had to choose day by day, minute by minute, sometimes second by second, to maintain hope that God's promises were in fact true. But the hard part was, all those promises, just in like Romans 8 alone that I shared with you guys, they didn't feel true at that time. I had to trust that all that work I put in to build a solid foundation actually was based on truth. And that in fact, nothing could separate me or Alex or Alexis from the love of God, not even sickness or death or grief. You know, I don't have time this morning to share perhaps really the most amazing part of my story, Um, this miraculous thing that happened, and uh, someday I think I'll have enough time or energy or whatever to get it put into a book or work with one of these producers that wants to make a movie out of the story and all these other things, but just like in super short form, um, I ended up finding a post-it note in Alex's office after he passed away, and on it he'd written 1 Chronicles 28.20. It said, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. Another promise to hope in that God was with me and would be with us. And my team, fueled by love, faith, and purpose went on to not only win the GSAC championship, but to unbelievably win the national championship too. Yet the biggest gift of our national championship is not the trophy or the record book or the championship rings that we have. It was the moment that the darkness lifted just enough to actually feel what God's word had been telling me all along, to actually catch a glimpse of that promise that I had placed my hope in each day that God really was with me and that he really was with us. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord God, my God, is with you. Which is why cutting down the nets wasn't what I'll remember most about that amazing journey. It was the moment as I was showering to get ready before the game. It was then that the darkness lifted just for that moment, and I knew without a doubt in the very core of my being that the promise I'd been placing my hope in each day for the prior nine months was in fact true, that God indeed was with me. And it was the moment in the locker room before the game with my team when without a doubt, they all knew that God was with us. And so it is my hope today uh, that these snippets of my story would encourage you on this Good Friday, that as you reflect on the death and resurrection of Christ, that you'll be challenged to just take the next step towards building your foundation on the solid rock. For some of you, that might mean going to the library or nowadays uh, on Amazon or on your iPad and checking out evidence that demands a verdict to see what evidence I'm talking about in the first place. 
Or my new favorite book to recommend these days uh, is actually uh, written by a Los Angeles homicide detective, and it's called Cold Case Christianity. Check that one out. For others of you, um, taking that next step might mean memorizing or meditating on God's promises to embed them in your heart and mind so that in your moment of need, they can speak back to you. And for some of you, this might just be the nudge that you need to rekindle your hope in a perfect God that even in our imperfection, he loved us enough to send Jesus to die on the cross so that upon his resurrection, our unity with God would be restored. Have a great Easter.